Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kevin Jeffries, President and CEO of the Leewood Chamber and Economic Development Council. We're happy to have you all here with us today, and I'm happy to welcome our panelists, Dr. Simran Elder, Dr. Teresa Hubkova, and Rennie Schuler McKinney as our panelists today. I also want to take a moment to um, thank Advent for their support of this event, but importantly too, I'd like to thank our annual sponsors for their ongoing support. Without their support, events like this would not be able to happen today. Our 2021 presidential sponsors include Advent Health, Country Club Bank, Cross First Bank, Demdeco, Evergy, and Menorah Medical Center. A special thank you especially goes to today's event sponsor, Advent Health. Your contribution to this event is greatly appreciated. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Ashley McDonald with Advent Health. As Administrative Director of Operations and Business Development, Ashley oversees the operational transition of Advent Health South Overland Park's inpatient hospital expansion with an expected opening date of fall of 2021. Ashley works closely with physician relations and recruitment teams to build expert medical staff for the South Overland Park campus, as well as their College Boulevard and Lenexa locations. Ashley also drives community relations efforts for all three campuses while managing program development and growth in areas identified for each location with an emphasis on hospital services at the South Overland Park area. Ashley earned her Bachelor of Science in Journalism degree from University of Kansas in 2004 and is currently working towards her executive MBA at Rockhurst University. Ashley is a member of the KU Alumni Association, the KC Network Board of Directors, the board for the Wonderscope Children's Museum, and is past chair of the Northeast Johnson County Chamber of Commerce. Ashley was also named the a 2018 Casey Business Journal Next Gen Leader. So Ashley, I'm gonna turn things over to you and thank you for joining us today and thank you for your sponsorship. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. As Kevin indicated, I am Ashley McDonald and work for Advent Health specifically at our South Overland Park location uh, located in the Blue Hawk development. So before we get started today, just wanted to take an opportunity to share a little bit about what's going on with Advent Health Kansas City. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm with the South Overland Park location at the Blue Hawk development. For those of you maybe who have attended a networking event before COVID um, at that campus or uh, maybe came to our groundbreaking, we opened the current outpatient campus back in 2017 and then broke ground on our inpatient expansion in 2019. So we are looking forward to expanding upon the outpatient services that we have here today, which includes a 24 seven emergency department, lab, imaging, physical therapy, as well as a variety of physician offices, really to care for our community and extend our healing mission to South Overland Park and South Johnson County. And then when we open that inpatient expansion in October, which is just around the corner, we will open with 38 inpatient beds with the ability to expand into 85 beds. Uh, and that will include a variety of services uh, really related to ICU, surgical services, cardiovascular services, and a variety of others. Uh, we do oftentimes get asked if we're gonna be delivering babies at this campus. And so um, thankfully we have um, the ability to say yes, and we are going to be doing that when we open uh, in just a few months, five months now. Uh, and then in addition to the South Overland Park location, Advent Health uh, also includes our College Boulevard campus, uh, Shawnee Mission campus, which many of you are probably familiar with at 75th and I-35, um, our Lenexa location, and then three Advent Health Center Care locations, which are our urgent care clinics, along with physician practic practices located throughout Johnson, Leavenworth, and Miami counties. But given the audience today, I certainly wanted to highlight our long history as Kansas City's leader in women's health. Uh, Advent Health Shawnee Mission had the area's first accredited breast center and today offers 3D and 2D mammography all at all three campuses. Advent Health Shawnee Mission, South Overland Park, and Lenexa. Our breast center and navigators are here to provide the personal support and guidance that women need if diagnosed with cancer. 
And then the treatment, of course, is backed by the Advent Health Cancer Center, uh, the area's only certified member of the MD Anderson Cancer Network. We also deliver a lot of babies at our Shawnee Mission location, more than 5,000 annually. Uh, and while we do have a beautiful facility for our patients, our legacy really stands on the compassionate care uh, from our nurses, physicians, and staff. And we partner with Children's Mercy on a variety of services as well. A unique service that is maybe lesser known is our Whole Health Institute, led by integrative medicine physician, Dr. Teresa Hakoga, who, who you will hear from on the panel today. And she uses a natural non-toxic therapies or therapies to, to treat the whole person and encourage the self-healing process. So she works alongside the conventional medical team to help un, un cover the underlying causes of ailments like digestive disorders, allergies, sleep issues, and more. So we are really excited about the future and the opportunity to continue providing the highest quality care uh, to those we serve and really having the ability to extend our faith-based mission and really glad to be here today and have the opportunity to host and always grateful for our partnership with the Leewood Chamber. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and just give a brief introduction of our uh, panelists here that we have today. So first, uh, Rennie Schuler McKinney. Rennie is, has, a de has dedicated her professional career to serving others and focusing on those struggling with depression and suicidal behavior. In her current role as Clinical Director of Behavioral Health Services at Advent Health Shawnee Mission, she leads multiple teams on the inpatient psychiatric unit the Intensive Outpatient Program, and the 24-Hour Behavioral assess Health Assessment Center. And then we have Dr. Hubkova. For more than a decade, Teresa Hubkova has been helping patients achieve better health and minimize their need for medications. Board certified in internal medicine, integrative, and holistic medicine, Dr. Hubkova's breadth of experience allows her to see her clients' health from many angles. She finds a natural approach to health and healing often more rewarding and safer than pharmaceuticals, but prescribes medications when necessary. And finally, Dr. Elder. Dr. Elder is a board certified medical oncologist and hematologist at Advent Health Medical Group, hematology oncology at Shawnee Mission. She also serves as the medical director for the Advent Health High Risk Breast Clinic at Shawnee Mission. So with that, uh, we will go ahead and get started with the panel, and I will turn it over to Renny, who's going to lead us in a mindfulness exercise before we get started with questions. Thank you, Ashley. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here today and uh, was actually thrilled that they asked that we could do some type of a mindfulness exercise. And for some of you, you may be like, what on earth are we going to be doing? But I have a couple of questions for you to start with. Have you ever been driving your car down the road and you're headed to your destination and when you arrive, you pause and think, I don't even remember which direction I came from, which route I took. Uh, yeah, I see you, <laughs> Dr. Hubcoven, you know we've, we've been there, right? Or you're sitting in a meeting and, and you're on agenda number two and, and someone else is talking and all of a sudden it dawns on you, we're already on agenda five and you have totally blocked out what was going on in your surroundings because your mind was preoccupied. This type of thing can happen even in our relationships. I think about conversations with my husband where sometimes he goes on and on and on and I kind of tune him out. And so we're going to practice a mindfulness exercise today where mindfulness really means well, we're going to be fully present, uh, focused on what's going on around us. Um, when they asked me to do this, I originally thought, oh, we'll all get down on our floor in our office and we'll start some breathing exercises. And anyway, I rethought that plan. And uh Thought maybe we would take a different form of mindfulness today. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention before we go into the exercise is that um, mindfulness can benefit us through uh, reduction of symptoms of depression and anxiety. It can help us with um, our cognitive functioning as well as our ability to manage stress. And I definitely, as my example shared a minute ago about my husband, I think it can improve our relationships too when we are fully present. So I would encourage you just to be comfortable in your chair as much as possible. And I'm gonna walk you through um, this simple exercise. I will tell you up front, uh, some people think, oh, this is the best thing ever. Others are like, eh, this is really not for me. Mindfulness does truly take practice in order to fine tune uh, your senses and how you actually approach um, being present. So start with a deep breath. 
inhale and exhale. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to really pay attention to your senses, the five senses. Um, we're gonna start by, I'm gonna ask you to notice five things that you can see around you. And maybe not the things you always see, such as your computer monitor, but maybe look around and identify a crack in the wall or um, maybe that lost ink pen over here on your desk. But just look around and kind of absorb your environment, identifying five different things in your head. Next, I would ask that you bring your full awareness into four things that you can feel. And I'm not talking about emotional feelings at this moment. I'm actually talking about things like the smoothness of your desk, uh, maybe the type of fabric um, your pants or skirt are made of. So identify four things that you can really feel. Next, we're gonna move into the sense of listening and hearing, uh, or I should say hearing. Um, take a moment to listen to your surroundings. And this time I'd like you to identify three things that you can hear. It may be the clock ticking, might be the humming of a refrigerator. And into the sense of smell, please bring into your awareness two things that you can smell. If your office is near the cafeteria, you might smell some food, maybe some fresh flowers in your office. And the final thing I would like you to think about one thing you can taste right now. You may wanna pick up your coffee cup or your water. The idea of mindfulness is to slow down, be aware of your environment, both externally and inside of our bodies. And therefore we go through this exercise to really um, pause. And um, you know that old saying, stop and smell the roses? There's some real truth to that, that we go through life and most of us on a very, very fast pace and that we forget to slow down and be very aware of what's going on. I hope you enjoyed that exercise. If you're interested, there's tons of them out on the internet. Just Google mindfulness um, and uh, start practicing being fully present. Ashley. Thank you so much, Rennie. That was a great way to, to kick us off this morning. Really appreciate that. All right, so to uh, get started with the panel, we're gonna uh, have a poll question that Deanna's gonna put up for us. So hopefully everyone is able to see this. If not, maybe just send a note in the chat, but this is related to, to Women's Health Month or and Women's Health Week specifically. Just give about 10 to 15 seconds to respond. All right, hopefully everyone had a chance to, to submit an answer and I'll just wait and see, here we go. Okay, so how is everyone nurturing mind, body and spirit to make each of you a priority? All of the above is the answer, very good. All right, so the first question is going to be for all of the panelists and this is really uh, about whole person care. So Advent Health, uh, is known for its approach to whole person care and want to get a sense from the panelists on how we define that. What does that mean? So let's start with uh, Dr. Elder. Thank you. Um, I would define whole person care as a care taking into account not only the patients, you know, medical diseases or medical uh, ailments, but uh, also their personal philosophy, um, their personal preferences and, and more of an individualized approach. Thank you, Dr. Elder, Dr. Hubkova. Yeah, I'll have to second that. You know, I always kind of look at the person as their body, mind, and spirit. They are all equally important. 
sometimes we forget about the spirit part, but uh, I like the quote from nurse Florence Nightingale, who said that spirit is just as important as any other organ in your body, and uh, we cannot ignore it. Uh, so yeah, really, that's the, you know, I always, as a physician, probably pay more attention to the body, but I have to consciously think of always bringing in the mind and spirit as well. A great point, Teresa, Teresa. I think it's always easy to just not think about spirit and or the spirit mind body. I'm sorry, mind component and focus more on the physical part and the and the body. So thank you for that. And Rennie? Yeah, and Dr. Hubkova, you said sometimes we overlook the spirit, and I agree with that. But as women, I think we often overlook our emotional side. Uh, that we tend to stuff our feelings down and we have to be the rock for everyone around us. And um, so I would really encourage everyone to remember that that is the third component. And uh, it's very important that if our emotional wellness is not intact, the rest of our body and our spirit are gonna be impacted. Kind of thinking about taking care of ourselves, Renny, you know, you said it that oftentimes we put that on the back burner and because we're caring for others and thinking about it from the standpoint of preventative care and knowing that that's so important, but oftentimes I think that can be something that we just put, um, like I said, on the back burner. So uh, let's talk with uh, the panelists about what preventative care is and why is it so important? Let's start with you, Dr. Hubkova. Yeah, so um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? <laughs> and I would love it if, if every patient who comes to me comes when they are still healthy and they, they want to do everything, they want to learn what they can do to stay healthy. And I do have some patients like that, which is fantastic. But uh, too often I see people who have not paid attention to prevention. And so now they have a lot of health issues and sometimes very serious health issues. And now they are on, you know, 20 different medications. And it's very sad because we actually have evidence that vast majority of diseases could be prevented. So um, for instance, we believe that 80 to 90% of heart attacks could be prevented. And really mostly with just a handful of things like uh, regular exercise, maintaining optimal weight, eating healthy diet, not smoking, um, making sure we get enough sleep and uh, have some kind of outlet for our stress. So these things are so important. And yet we somehow kind of tend to ignore it sometimes and wait until the disease comes and, and forces us to see a physician. So I think prevention is really, really key. And I think as physicians, we actually can do much better with prevention. Um, we sometimes also test things a little too late. Uh, and that's why I love being in the field of lifestyle medicine, functional medicine and integrative medicine, because we really try to push the, the envelope of prevention even, even further uh, upstream uh, before even pre-diabetes happens. You know, I look for pre-pre-diabetes uh, before you would develop cancer. I look at are you exposed to some environmental toxins that could contribute? Um, how well do you sleep? What do you eat? I go through your lifestyle with a very, very fine comb and try to identify where your weaknesses are, where you may be making some mistakes that you don't realize could lead over time to disease and try to correct them before it's too late. So <laughs> I hope that I hope I answered you. It was kind of a long-winded answer. No, that was great, Dr. Hubkova, and, and I'd invite Dr. Elder to, to weigh in on that question as well. Uh, yes, I definitely agree with Dr. Hubkova, and I think um, a lot of that ties in with the whole person care that we discussed. You know, um, I think an important aspect of uh, preventive care is regular visits with your physician, um, knowing that we're all individuals, we're all different in our, you know, individual risk factors, our lifestyle factors that put us at risk for different illnesses are all different. And so, you know, having a continuous relationship for screening and visits with um, your physician is, is important. Um, and then additional, uh, I agree with everything Dr. Hubkova said, and then additionally, I would just add, um, you know, regular visits can give more opportunities for our um, known um, cancer screening, for example, um, making sure that, you know, things like mammograms and such do not get missed or pushed too late. Um, and so um, I, that's how I kind of define preventive care. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Elder. Yes, regular visits, definitely something that I feel like um, more and more, especially for me personally, as I get older, that that's so much more important and just making it an annual thing or whatever it might be, just to make sure it's kept a priority is certainly important. Um, okay, let's go to our next poll question. All right, so go ahead and just take a few seconds to answer this one about breast cancer. All right, well, everyone <laughs> aced this, this quiz. So approximately one in seven to eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. True, so nice work, everyone. And now we'll move into uh, thinking about that topic. What type of cancer screening tests should a woman do? At what age and how often? Dr. Elder, can you start us out with that? Yes. Um, so for women, the, the primary uh, cancers to be aware of for screening in my mind are um, breast cancer, lung cancer, cervical cancer, and then colon cancer. Um, there are some varying recommendations by, you know, the big societies that guide us um, on age and some variability in frequency as well. Um, seeing cancer patients and being a cancer doctor, I do tend to favor, you know, the younger ages on uh, in that spectrum. And so um, for breast cancer screening, um, I would recommend um, by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, um, starting at the age of 40, um, and then uh, yearly mammograms if possible. Um, and then for lung cancer, the recommendation um, you know, varies a little bit as well, but in general, it's um, in patients who have a um, heavy smoking history defined as, you know, about a pack per day for 30 years um, for the ages of 55 to 74, um, if the patient is still smoking or has quit in um, less than 15 years ago, it's recommended to get a low dose uh, chest CT screening. Um, and then additionally, uh, cervical cancer, the recommendation eight, recommended age for starting is uh, 21 years of age with the uh, frequency varying by the type of test that's performed by the doctor. It can be you know, yearly every three years or every five years. And then for colon cancer, we now fortunately have um, several different screening modalities available, but the age to start is recommended uh, to be the age of 50, though there are some studies looking at maybe modifying that for certain populations, um, but currently the recommendation is 50. Um, or the um, if a patient has a uh, mother, father, sister, brother, or child that was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer 10 years before that person was diagnosed. Um, so that's kind of the general recommendation for cancer screening in women. Dr. Hopkova, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, uh, absolutely. And again, you know, I, I feel so fortunate that I am in the field in which I am because I always like to go further. Can I do more to prevent uh, the cancer from developing? You know, because uh, I think we can. I have two friends who developed uh, breast cancer at very young age. One of them was in, in her mid thirties. The other one was uh, early, early forties. And they felt, both of them felt that they actually had a pretty healthy lifestyle. They were kind of taken by surprise. And uh, breast cancer is still rising. We still see more and more breast cancer. And in, in fact, in young women, it has doubled over the past several decades. And so why, why is that? Uh, we have gotten better in treating it, <laughs> thankfully, uh, but, but it's still rising. And, um, when uh, my friends uh, actually underwent uh, some further testing, it, it, it turned uh, out that one of them had uh, certain genetic predispositions uh, that made her less good at dealing with environmental toxins. Um, we know that we are exposed to a lot of environmental toxins that resemble estrogen. We call them xenoestrogens. 
from plastics and sometimes cosmetics and food. And there is some emerging evidence that especially uh, in uh, when we are exposed to these chemicals, when we are still in mother's womb or as uh, babies, young children, that it already changes the breast tissue uh, and uh, may make us more sensitive to cancer further down the road. Um, so um, how do you know if you are exposed to these things unless you look, right? So we, we actually have testing for these things and then you can change the way you eat. You can look at the cosmetics that you use. You can look, what do you use for cleaning your house? What's under your kitchen sink? What's in your bathroom? You know, some of the worst toxins are in our own homes. Uh, you can make sure you don't uh, get exposed to pesticides uh, sprayed around your, your house like glyphosate. So um, that is kind of like one important thing that I think has been overlooked looking for environmental toxins and, and uh, xenoestrogens or environmental endocrine disruptors. But then the other opportunity is how, how much do you exercise? You know, if you don't exercise, now we say that that's like this, as bad as smoking one pack cigarettes a day. So I'm sure that none of you who listen to this smoke, people know smoking is bad for us. But do you know that being sedentary is just as bad as smoking one pack of cigarettes per day? So um, I want to make sure every woman knows that. Um, sometimes we have uh, bacterial imbalances in the gut that can make it more likely that you kind of recycle your estrogen that your estrogen is getting reabsorbed from the intestines and that can actually increase your levels. And that could be detected on a stool test and we can do something about it. Uh, so um, vitamin D is another example. You know, what's your vitamin D level? We know that women with low vitamin D are more likely to have breast cancer. They are more likely to have heart attack. They are more likely to catch COVID or have uh, heart disease. So um, I think again, the prevention can do so much. Uh, if you just come and uh, let us help you, we can do so much to prevent these things from happening. Thank you, Dr. Hopkova. And I know when you shared that being sedentary or not exercising is equivalent to um, smoking one pack of cigarettes a day. That's just, that is something that I remember you sharing in another webinar and has really stuck with me. So um, definitely eye-opening to hear that. So appreciate that. Uh, let's shift now to talking about the leading cause of death among women. Um, so Dr. Hopkova, if you want to lead us on this one. And I think, you know, people oftentimes assume that our genes are our destiny. Uh, how are genes, so talk about how our genes are impacted by the food we eat. Um, and I know you talked a little bit about this just now, but maybe as it relates to um, the leading cause of death and then um, how often we exercise and how we sleep and so on also um, being impacted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let me ask, the first question was, what's the leading cause of death in women? And that's still heart disease, you know, so as much as we worry about our breast, uh, heart disease is the number one killer in men and in women across different races. Uh, so, and, and again, we can prevent 80 to 90% of heart disease can be prevented. Uh, that is from the nurses uh, health study that showed that with just a few healthy habits, you can prevent 80 to 90% of heart disease. But when we screen people for heart disease, oftentimes we just look at their blood pressure and cholesterol. And what do we forget sometimes, or not here, but sometimes it's forgotten to check C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation. And uh, there are some studies that indicate that especially in women, if they have elevated C-reactive protein, marker of inflammation, that that is actually more predictive of future heart attack than having high cholesterol. So make sure you always have that checked when you go for your yearly physical. So that's a marker of inflammation. And then um, the other sometimes forgotten part of that can lead to heart disease is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is, uh, is basically damage to our tissues by free uh, oxygen radicals, uh, and um, some, something called the reactive oxygen species. And um, that again is tied sometimes to environmental toxins. So uh, we used to think of toxins at, as at the bottom uh, or we didn't think about them at all. And now they are kind of rising up and uh, approximately 20% of death from strokes and heart attacks are now attributed to pollution. So it really has to be something that we start looking at uh, uh, if we want to be successful in preventing heart disease. Um, and of course, you know, obesity um, uh, and insulin resistance, which is uh, 
pre-diabetes, those things can be easily detected and we, we can do something about it and we have to do something about it because insulin resistance and obesity are one of the biggest drivers of not just heart disease, but also cancer and uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, so yeah, so that's in terms of um, heart disease. The second, second part of the question was, um, what kind of role genes play? And genes actually play a relatively small role, kind of like the big genes, like for breast cancer, we think about BRCA1 and 2, or in terms of uh, cholesterol, we think of maybe familiar hypercholesterolemia, but genes in general play maybe a role in only like 5 to 10% of these conditions. Uh, so vast, uh, vast majority is your lifestyle and your environment. Um, so on those, those two things, we can to some degree change. Lifestyle, we can change a lot. Environment, we have to collectively kind of as, as women push to some improvements in our environment. Uh, but um, it now uh, is kind of uh, becoming known that there are a lot of uh, less important genes that we were kind of ignoring because they, we thought that they were less important. Um, uh, we call them low penetrance genes. But now we are learning that actually, if you look at them kind of in their totality, that they actually are important. And those are the genes that we can uh, turn on and off with food, with certain supplements, with exercise, with sleep. So um, we can hugely lower our risk of some diseases by turning off some of these undesirable genes with, with healthy lifestyle. So in the end, I think, more diseases are genetically driven, but they are the genes that can be influenced by what we put in our mouths, uh, how we move and sleep and stress, etc. So it's all good news, I think. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that, Dr. Hubkova. Now we want to take a time to transition to thinking about stress, something that I think we all deal with, and especially coming off of the top of this pandemic, um, that being even more so. So we're going to switch gears and have Rennie chime in and talk a little bit about the common signs of stress, burnout, anxiety, and depression. Thanks, Ashley. Um, you know, when we think about across America, when one in five individuals, adults, suffer from depression, most of you probably know some of those signs, um, but when we talk about stress and burnout, they often overlap, and sometimes over the over the period of time, those can lead to depression and or anxiety. Um, when I think about burnout, I think about my foot pressed to the accelerator in my car, and then I'm not letting up. It's just go, go, go all the time, and that there's never a break. Uh, I often feel very overwhelmed and uh, sometimes even disorganized in my thinking because I just can't juggle everything that's coming my way. Some specific signs of depression, uh, of course, we know that the sadness, emptiness, or loneliness, um, sleep disturbance where um, one can't sleep at all, or maybe the other extreme where all I wanna do is sleep and I find myself in bed for 18 hours per day. Um, one that I, I don't know if everyone thinks about in terms of those signs is, is the lack of interest in activities that maybe you've enjoyed in the past. So you've given up your favorite, favorite hobby because of that exhaustion, uh, or maybe you've attended church every Sunday, non-COVID time, sorry about that. Uh, and now you just don't have the energy to get out of bed and go. Another um, sign of depression is related to our appetite and um, where maybe we've lost our appetite and there may be a significant weight loss. Again, on the other extreme, maybe we're eating everything in sight. We have these cravings and we're trying to feed those emotions. I also don't wanna overlook the fact that irritability can play a big role in anxiety and depression and um, even anger outburst. I'll never forget a time in, in my past when I was treating adolescents and I had the angriest kid on earth in my office. And lo and behold, the young teen, a male, uh, was really, really depressed. But he was so uncomfortable with those feelings, he wasn't sure what to do. And so he's acting out constantly and biting people's heads off. Once treated, he felt a lot of relief and, and so did his family and, and friends. Uh, a couple of other thoughts around uh, those signs. Um, definitely individuals who are thinking that life isn't worth living. Uh, that can be a, a sign that we sure don't wanna go unnoticed and wanna be sure that we're asking the right questions um, when we suspect someone 
or ourselves uh, are feeling like giving up on life. And how would you say, Rennie, thinking about COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, how has that impacted mental health overall? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we've definitely seen an increase um, in individuals struggling. And I, I think the, the key factor there is the isolation. Uh, for most of us, uh, we are out at our jobs, we're doing things on the weekends, in the evenings, we're talking to our neighbors, we're having our neighbors over. And when that came to a stop, um, I don't think we were prepared uh, as a nation, and how could we, uh, to be able to cope with that high degree of isolation. And then you couple that with the significant amount of grief that we've all experienced, whether it's the loss that I haven't seen uh, my loved one for over a year, or the loss of a loved one to uh, COVID. Um, I think that those two factors, the isolation and the grief has really had an impact on our overall mental health. So thinking about how we can maybe have some strategies or tools in our toolbox um, to help prevent and manage that stress, that burnout, the loneliness, and some of the other feelings that you described, Rennie. Can you talk us through that a little bit? And then I'll let Dr. Hubkova weigh in as well. Sure. sure. Well, of course, I would go back to the mindfulness exercise. And, and as I said earlier, that may work for some and not for everyone, but I would encourage you to give it a chance uh, and to really try to stay focused on yourself. And it's really, in my mind, a gift to yourself by, by taking that two or three minutes, uh, maybe in your office, setting, shutting your laptop for a few minutes, turning the phone off and, and just breathing. I will guarantee you that that two to three minutes will be quite worthwhile later in the day. And so I think that's a very simple thing that each of us might be able to commit to each and every day. Um, another idea would be to ask the five, um, the five year question. And the five year question to me means, in five years, this thing that I'm so incredibly stressed about today, will it really matter? Now, there are definitely some things that we would say yes to, but most of what we entertain in our heads that are overwhelming and stressful um, often are not gonna matter in a few years or maybe even tomorrow. Uh, and then my final suggestion might be um, to really consider therapy. Uh, I, if we were in the same room, I'd ask for a show of hands uh, of how many of you have ever taken personal lessons to make an improvement in your life. Uh, private lessons for golf, I want a better golf game, or um, I want to learn to play the piano. And I'm guessing many of us have, could put our hands up to that question. And to me, therapy is so stigmatized and that we sure don't talk to our girlfriends about uh, whether or not we're seeing a therapist. But to me, um, it's not any different than those golf lessons. It's a way to improve ourselves, to have a neutral sampling board, and as stressful as things have been over the last year, I think having a, a person that you can talk to openly can definitely benefit not only your mental health, but your overall health. That's so true, Rennie. And I love what you said about the five-year question and really helping to put some of those things that you stress out or stress about on a daily basis and really, I think, helps put things into perspective, right? So thank you for sharing some of those strategies. Dr. Hubkova? Yeah, I, I love what Rennie said, and especially with, with breathing, you know, when we are anxious and stressed, we tend to breathe faster and, and more shallow, and that can perpetuate the anxiety. And when we focus on our breath and we slow it down consciously, that slow breathing is sending signals to our brain that we are relaxed. So by doing some breathing exercises, you can absolutely reduce your stress levels and anxiety, and that can help you sleep, that can help to lower your blood pressure, relax your muscles if you have some chronic neck pain or back pain. So I work a lot with breath. I actually don't do it so much myself. I refer people for breath work uh, to people who know how to do biofeedback. That's one of my favorite, favorite tools is biofeedback, which is where you do these breathing exercises. You're guided by a therapist and you can see on a computer screen how that slow breathing is lowering your blood pressure, relaxing your muscles, sometimes even changing temperature in your fingers um, and uh, how you, you are more focused when you do that. So I have mapped out all the biofeedback providers within 10 miles of my office and I send people, people very often or I send them to Dr. Sabapathy. So that's one of the fantastic techniques that I think we should teach to kids at school because there are no side effects. And it, it is so beneficial for so many things. Hot flashes also, menopause. Um, 
then I uh, like to work a lot with acupuncturists. I also refer people to acupuncture quite often. And that's a fantastic way to kind of uh, um, stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest and relax. And uh, a lot of healing comes just from that. And of course it has other mechanisms of action as well. Um, so those are probably my two favorite ways of reducing stress. Music is another one, music therapy. And that can be just that you listen to your favorite music or you sing or you play instrument, or you could actually work with a professional music therapist. And there are some wonderful ones in this area. Uh, and there are studies that show that music can improve your immune system. You make more natural killer cells, for instance. So that can fight, help you fight cancer or help you fight COVID or other viruses. Um, you improve your DHEA hormone levels with listening to music. And that is like your longevity hormone, your vitality, your zest hormone that helps you hold on to muscle and bones and be stronger. Um, and it reduces levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Uh, so there are a lot of studies on these simple techniques uh, that they, they go really long way. Um, did I answer everything that you asked? <laughs> Yes, thank you. And it looks like Renny might have something else. To well, add. I was just going to say, Dr. Hepkova, and, and to everyone that I'll never forget when I was first referred to biofeedback in college. I was 19, high anxiety related to test taking and just being a college student. And the butterflies on the screen, they were trying to get me to calm my body as the butterflies went down into the butterfly net. And the calmer I got, the butterflies softly went in. But if I would tense up, they would scatter. And uh, that has been a technique I have used throughout my life. Uh, but had no idea what biofeedback was until I actually went. So I highly recommend it as well. So thanks for mentioning it. Yes, thank you. And thinking about, so we just heard a little bit about some of the strategies that we can take on ourselves to help reduce that stress and anxiety. What if uh, we have a friend or family member who is struggling? Renny, uh, starting with you, can you tell us maybe about how we can support that person who's struggling and be there for them? Absolutely. Uh, first is, of course, very active listening. Um, and I think um, making sure that we don't um, place ourselves in the expert role. Um, and sometimes we avoid conversations because we're not the expert. Uh, what I would say is you don't have to be the expert to be a good listener. And with our rates of suicide skyrocketing in the nation uh, over the last um, many years, uh, I would encourage you to ask direct questions if you think someone is truly struggling beyond um, maybe depression and thinking possibly of taking their life. Uh, I hear so often people are like, well, I, I just didn't know what to say. And I'm here to share with you, you will not plant a seed in their head. If they're thinking about suicide, they're well on their way. And by you simply asking, are you concerned, are you thinking about harming yourself or possibly taking your life? That individual will feel so much relief that you've asked. And now you, that individual will probably open up Again, you don't have to know all the resources, but once you know that, once you identify that somebody's at risk, then I would encourage you to sit with them and maybe even say, you know, I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is I'm going to be right here with you and we're going to figure this out together. Um, at Advent Health, we have a behavioral health assessment center, which is uh, available Monday through Friday. It's actually free to the community, no cost. So the individuals who are really struggling and don't know where to go, they can call us. We will get an appointment typically within 24 hours, you can come in, we'll do an assessment and help point that individual. And, and you, if you're the friend, you can sure come in as well um, to, to be a support person and we'll help point them in the right direction. That's all really helpful information, Renny. Thank you for sharing that. And now just for the sake of time, we're getting close to wrapping up. So uh, now on to the concluding questions. And then hopefully if you haven't, I haven't seen any message or any questions come through the chat, but we'll have an opportunity to, um, for people to ask questions. So what family, this is for, for all um, panelists, what family oriented activities are available to support healthy living? Uh, Dr. Elder, let's start with you. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the uh, family-centered activities that can, you know, promote a healthy lifestyle are uh, good bonding activities too. And so I think really just getting outside, you know, lots of kids love to be outside, um, going on walks, swimming, going on a bike ride. Um, those are great ways to get some exercise and get some vitamin D. 
Um, and then, um, you know, learning to cook a new dish together, learning to cook some healthy food um, can also be a good bonding activity and, and promote a healthy lifestyle as well. And thankfully now with us getting into the spring months or now well into May, we can get outside and get that vitamin D, which I think is really helpful for the whole family. <laughs> All right, Dr. Hopkova. Yeah, absolutely. I, I second everything that Dr. Elder said. I love picking my uh, family and go in nature, sometimes even camping, so we can actually feel the ground uh, and smell the, the trees, the pine trees in the morning when there, there is still dew on them. Uh, I, there is so much healing in nature. Um, but I also like, love cooking with children. And actually, my fantastic colleague, Lisa Markley, who is amazing functional integrative nutritionist and chef. So she also puts the knowledge into these practical, amazingly yummy recipes. She's teaching monthly classes that you can join on Zoom and you can cook with your children. So if there are easy recipes that children can manage and I uh, try to attend these classes whenever I can with my 80 year old daughter and she loves it. And there are studies that show that if children cook, they are then more likely to eat healthy foods. If they cook with you with healthy foods and vegetables, they are more likely to then eat vegetables. So, so definitely give that a shot. That's great. And at least for me, I think with my seven-year-old, that would put less pressure on, um, you know, do, being able to do it virtual and in my own kitchen. So if it's messy and things are everywhere, <laughs> versus that's the beauty, I guess, of being able to do that virtually. So thank you for sharing that. And Rennie, how about you? You know, I'm a real advocate for um, family meal time and in our busy lives, and especially as things are starting to pick up again in our community, um, really committing to, even if it's two nights a week, that we sit down as a family. Um, also in, in our immediate family, we have um, family meetings and uh, it used to be when we had to pull together, we'd go to the fancy living room and we'd talk to our daughter about some of her behaviors. And as she moved into high school, it switched to her pulling in, calling the family meeting, pulling us in and talking to us about how she needed support or things that maybe we have done if my husband and I were in an argument. And so it was a place where we'd come together, everybody was respectful and um, we just had time, intentional time to process what was going on in our family. Uh, it feels a little awkward up front, but I, I look back over the years and absolutely love our family meeting times. Learned a lot from our kid through those. I love that, Renee. Thank you for sharing that with all of us. All right, and then finally, what is one health-related recommendation or change in behavior you think women should start today or tomorrow? Renee, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Uh, earlier I said, uh, as women and probably men too, uh, we don't like to talk if we're in therapy. If you're seeing a therapist, please tell three people today that you're seeing a therapist because people will look at you and go, oh, you need to see a therapist? Absolutely. It's helping me. And so really kind of helping uh, break down that stigma uh, related to behavioral health, mental health, substance use. Um, and if you could um, help with that, I think our society overall would be so much better. All right, Teresa or Dr. Hopkova. Oh boy, I don't know if I can choose just one, you know, because for different people, there'll be different ones, but don't skip on your sleep. Sleep is like a medicine that is so important. I always say sleep is sacred. Don't let anything disturb it. Get your preferably eight hours, really. We say seven to eight hours, but eight hours is probably better for brain health. Um, that is so important. And we sometimes tend to push it away. You know, we are too busy. We want to squeeze in more exercise or more time um, to do whatever and and but no the sleep is is hugely important so don't don't skimp on it <laughs> thanks Teresa I know that's a good reminder I think it's all oh, we know that sleep is so important but I think oftentimes like you said it gets pushed aside for a workout or for something else so making sure that it's it's a priority as much as possible and Dr. Elder yeah, um, I would have to say, I agree, it's really hard to pick just one, but um, I would say making sure to um, get LinkedIn or stay LinkedIn with a primary care doctor and getting the cancer screening, especially with COVID, things have gotten pushed because of, you know, time and fear of going to the hospitals. And I think, you know, at this point, it's important to, to catch up or get on top of um, cancer screening. All right, very good. Well, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin to wrap us up for today. Look, I'm back. <laughs> well, that was 
excellent information. I, I just so enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this with the folks in my family, because there's a lot of great information for women here, but for men as well, certainly for some things health-wise that we can do. The sleep thing, Dr. Hubkova. Yeah. I woke up early this morning so I could exercise. That probably might not have been as good a thing because we had a meeting early. So maybe I just need to go to bed earlier. So good, good messages from all of you. And Rennie, your information about the mental health stuff, such an important thing for our society and everyone these days. And we all need to keep mindful of that. And Dr. Elder, you had some great information for us as well. And I really do appreciate all of you participating today. It is available, but I encourage you to share this information with as many people as you can because it's very very important to all of our health and so thank you again and i appreciate again advent health sponsorship of this event and i would just echo what you said kevin and certainly advent health appreciates our partnership with the leewood chamber and uh, i enjoyed the opportunity to to be with some of my colleagues today and hopefully you were all able to or the participants were able to take a um, a nugget of information to help apply it to their their daily lives and and ultimately become healthier. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Really glad to be here today. Thank you. Appreciate it.